I'm Tom Baker, this is Chasing Cars, and today we're comparing the new Mark 8 Volkswagen Golf GTI against the updated Hyundai i30N with the DCT gearbox. Here in Australia, the hot hatch category is still a really important type of car for those of us who appreciate you know, a sporty drive combined with a form factor that suits itself well to the necessities of everyday life. These are cars that you can fit passengers in, you can fit cargo in, you can blend in in traffic if you want to, but on the weekend when you get these things out onto a B road, they are seriously stunning from behind the wheel. Now, really, these two are kind of the double header of the hot hatch segment here in Australia. The Volkswagen Golf GTI is the classic of the segment, the progenitor of the segment. The Hyundai i30N just smashed into the hot hatch category about four years ago with this loud mouth, brash interpretation of what these front wheel drive heroes are all about. But the i30N was manual only, and the Golf GTI was on the cusp of going automatic only. Now, the two compete far more squarely. Hyundai, after years of development, are finally ready to put an eight-speed wet clutch, dual clutch automatic into the i30N, which of course means it now competes very squarely against the seven-speed DSG transmission, which is the sole choice here in Australia for the Golf GTI. So, out of the new Golf GTI and the updated i30N, which of these hot hatches does automatic performance hatchback form factors better? That's what we're gonna find out in today's video. First of all, we'll start under the bonnet of each car, talking about their capabilities and their specifications. Then we'll head onto the road and we'll wrap up by looking at the interiors and talking about the running costs. But before we get started, hit subscribe down below the video. The mechanical package of these hot hatches is pretty similar. They're both based around two liter inline turbocharged four cylinder petrol engines. But it's the one under the bonnet of the i30 that's a little bit stronger. For the facelift of the car, which includes this new front end and a few tidier angles around the rest of the exterior, Hyundai have bumped the power and torque on the two litre engine under the bonnet of this car to 206 kilowatts of power and 392 newton metres of torque. And there continues to be an overboost function for limited periods of additional boost. What's interesting though, is that on top of the six speed manual gearbox that you can still get on the i30N here in Australia, there's now the option of what this car is running, an eight speed wet clutch DCT automatic that's also shared with vehicles like the Sonata N-Line, the Kia Sorento and the Hyundai Santa Fe. But as we'll see, the tuning is considerably superior here in the i30N. It's taken about three or four years to get an auto i30N ready. It's now here. Just like the manual though, you also get an ELSD on the front axle that works pretty hard in this car. You get a variable exhaust, you get variable dampers, and we'll run through those customized drive mode settings a little bit later in this video. Under the bonnet of the Mark 8 Golf GTI is an engine which is very familiar to GTI fans because Volkswagen's EA888 two liter turbo petrol engine has been in service in Golf GTIs since the Mark V. So at this point, you would call it tried and tested. Throughout that time, there have been so many tech changes to the engine that it's pretty unfair to say that it's you know, been around for the best part of 20 years, but a lot of the core pieces of this engine are noted for their durability. Now, the particular tune of the EA888 that the Golf GTI gets carries over from the Mark 7.5 version of this car, producing 180 kilowatts of power and 370 newton meters of torque. While you can get a six-speed manual overseas, a seven-speed DSG automatic is the only choice here in Australia. And again, like the i30N, an electronically controlled, mechanically locking LSD on the front axle is standard fit to the Golf GTI. In terms of which of these cars is faster, well, the i30N has more grunt, the Golf GTI is lighter. The zero to 100 claim of 5.4 seconds for the i30N puts it a little bit ahead, but next up, we're gonna find out whether that really pans out in the real world. So in this company, up against an updated i30N with even more power than the previous one, how does the new Mark 8 Golf GTI stack up? Now, if you've been a long time follower of the Chasing Cars channel, you'll know that about four years ago, we put the then Mark 7.5 Golf GTI into a four-way test against the i30N the Civic Type R and the Peugeot 
8 GTI 270. And at that point, up against the first iteration of the i30N, we gave the win to the Golf GTI because the Mark 7.5 was just such a perfectly dainty, traditional front-wheel drive hot hatch that really worked with its driver to level up each of their abilities. You know, car and driver was such a good match in that Mark 7.5 GTI. So initially, it bodes pretty well that the Mark 8 GTI is so similar to the Mark 7.5. We have an evolution of the MQB chassis and we have a carryover engine, the 2.0-litre EA888 petrol turbocharged four-cylinder producing 180 kilowatts of power and 370 newton meters of torque sent to the front wheels via a seven-speed wet clutch DSG dual clutch automatic and there's also an electronically controlled but mechanically locking limited slip differential going on up there. So against the i30N it's a similar story to the last time we had these cars pitched against one another. The i30N is more powerful but the Golf GTI is lighter. And those two things tend to cancel each other out, really, in terms of real world pace out on a country road. However, there are absolutely key differences to the style of the way these cars drive. As I mentioned in my Mark 8 GTI review, which is available on the channel, the new GTI carries on that great tradition of also being a real GT car, as well as an involving driver focused hatchback and that's really what you get here you get a blend of comfort refinement and luxury with the ability to turn it on on a country back road quite convincingly indeed and that's kind of how it is on the surface but it's really when you start digging down into the Golf GTI's abilities that this car's true talents become clear they won't be clear to people that just want a hot hatch to get in, stamp the throttle to the floor in virtually every instance and just expect the car to do everything. Something like an Audi RS3 or Golf R will do that pretty well. Even the i30N will because its LSD works quite a lot harder than the one in the Golf GTI. While we have that diff on the GTI, this car is actually still all about a partnership between driver and hot hatch you're doing much, much more to make the GTI perform. You need to have more patience with this car, which some see as a detriment and others see as a traditional hot hatch aspect. You're trail braking more to bring that rear end around and help out the front end on corner exit. You need to load up the car mid corner and then feed in the throttle linearly, get that differential working and spear yourself out of the corner. It's a far more nuanced and involved experience driving a Golf GTI quickly and either you're the kind of driver that wants that level of involvement or you're not. In light of the i30N being here in comparison that car feels brawnier and it feels so much more willing to just go when you plant the throttle mid-corner. Its diff is a harder worker it's got significantly grippier tires and it will just pull you out of a corner Mitsubishi Evo style. And in some ways, I actually think the i30N feels more like a four wheel drive car than a front wheel drive hot hatch in that sense. It doesn't suffer from those sorts of corner, mid corner grip, corner exit grip deficiencies that you usually have in a hot hatch. And you do have in the Golf GTI. Because we don't get the club sport specification here in Australia, or at least not get, we have instead a smaller wheel, we have taller sidewalls and more modest tyres. We've got Bridgestone Potenza tyres here, 225-40 R18 in size. And so these uh, slightly chunkier tyres and smaller wheels are actually a fantastic partnership on a country road. Uh, Australia is full of pockmarked B roads and you're going to soak up more of those bumps, particularly the scary ones, uh, with this taller sidewall and just more generous amount of tyre. But at the same time, the tyre bends more, it leans more, and it's just a potenza compared with the Pirelli P08 Gens on the Hyundai, and it just doesn't stand up to the same amount of punishment. If you drive the GTI like the i30N, leaning on the tyres, getting on the throttle early and hard, 
it all falls apart. It feels disappointing in the GTI. But instead, trail breaking into a corner, setting up that rear end nicely, playing with the really delightful chassis on this car, getting it loaded up and then feeding in throttle gradually. This car, it, you know, it almost becomes an intellectual exercise, almost like skiing well or something like that, where you have to, you know there's so many constituent parts to making a turn quickly and cleanly. For me, I like that. I like, I like leveling up those abilities as a driver, learning what a car needs in order to be able to make it perform, and then, you know, putting all of those pieces together as you drive it. If you're not as patient as that, and you don't have the time for all of that crap, and you just want to get in and drive hard, the i30N is going to suit you really well. And that's not to say that the Hyundai doesn't have layers of sophistication, because it definitely does, and it's a more sophisticated car now than when it launched in 2018. But it has that brawn and that muscle and that kind of... It's not one-dimensional, but it, it has such an ability to just take your commands and see them through immediately that that will appeal to another style of driver. Now, on the other things the GTI does well, you know, it's comfortable. It's a Golf. It may have a GTI badge on this new steering wheel, but it's a Golf. More comfortable seats, definitely. Ventilation on the seats is something that you'll appreciate in summer as well. The cabin is more modern, it's more clean. We've spoken about the technology not being quite my cup of tea yet. But your view forward is really nice in this car, customizable gauges, good driving position, you're comfortable, you can do long stints. I did almost a thousand Ks in one stint in the new GTI and didn't get uncomfortable or frustrated. Better speakers and we have adaptive cruise control compared to the manual cruise in the i30. We've really got Volkswagen's latest and most full suite of safety tech here, so it does feel a step ahead on some of those fronts. So, facelift i30N DCT up against the GTI. Where's the difference? <laughs> well, there's the first one. Hopefully some of that sound comes through on the video, but the i30N DCT has retained all of its great oral personality uh, from the pre-facelift and the manual version, which you can still get, which is a nice choice that Volkswagen Australia don't give you with the GTI. All of those silly Larry noises, pops, crackles, they all carry over from the manual. Some people, including me, were worried that the auto wouldn't really have that same kind of juvenile oral persona. Turns out we had nothing to worry about. And in fact, there's more to the sound of this car because the upshifts have that characteristic fart noise that a dual clutch box makes. So you've now got like the whole symphony in the i30N and I love that. The Golf GTI is so refined and so luxurious that it's it's lost its kind of its sound that it once had. You can still hear it, it's still there, and every so often the GTI will still give you some overrun noise, almost by mistake, almost that it just slips out. But of course all the emissions protocols and whatnot that affect Volkswagen more than they affect Hyundai at this stage have tightened uh, the ability of the Golf GTI to sound really great. Uh, Compared to that, the i30N, you know, yes, okay, it is a little juvenile, but I guess so am I at times. Sound aside though, these are very, very different cars. That's really the simplest way I can put it. They always have been, but as the Golf GTI Mark 8 has stayed on the same trajectory as the Mark 7.5 as a driver's car, the i30N has continued to diverge away from that path. Perhaps it's about the fact that we are entering probably the last decade of internal combustion and Hyundai are clearly throwing a lot of resources at the N program. I think they're trying to make their N cars as, as crazy and as leery as they can be, whereas Volkswagen, they know their customer. The Golf GTI does appeal to traditional hot hatch fans and drivers like me, but it also is a luxury car at the same time. The i30N isn't trying to be a luxury car. 
In fact, it's on the firm edge of what I'd want a daily. The low speed ride in this car is tiring, to be completely honest. It actually feels like it's gotten a little more stiffly sprung than the pre-facelift version. But there are other changes mechanically. We've moved to a forged alloy wheel. There's less unsprung weight on this car. There's a bunch of changes. But it's definitely a harder edged car, particularly when you're comparing it directly to the Golf GTI on the same roads as we're doing right now. And that's gonna to appeal to a lot of people. You sit into this car, you're definitely lower slung. This new seat is lower. They've ditched the electric adjustment for the premium. An electric adjustment actually prevents a seat from getting as low most of the time. So you're sitting lower than in the previous high-spec i30N. There's this innate control to the ride, even in the softest suspension. You know that you're behind the wheel of something designed to be quite a serious performance car here. And a nice wheel, it is too chunky. We've got direct access to the custom drive modes on this car, well to all of the drive modes, but the custom mode continues to be my preference. But really the same virtues and vices that the i30N had in pre-facelift form largely carry over here to the updated car. They include a brawny engine that really does its best work in the low and mid-range. It will rev out, but it's really quite torquey and quite muscular off the line and in the mid-range. It's a classic 2.0-litre turbo in that sense. We do have more power here, 206 kilowatts of power, 392 newton meters of torque, and there's the new N-Grin Shift mode for the DCT, which unlocks additional overboost for 20 seconds, which is actually quite generous. So if you want extra punch to pass someone or you just come to your favorite segment of corners, you can unlock 20 seconds of additional overboost, which is pretty cool. The transmission is obviously the big news. The six-speed manual continues in Australia. We really like the manual. The car pairs well to the manual. But in actual fact, you can tell that Hyundai took their time developing this DCT. And didn't they ever take their time? I mean, it was four years in development uh, you know, from the first time a Hyundai engineer spoke to me about an i30N auto to me sitting in the car now is about four years. But while usually a delay like that wouldn't really impress you much, in the case of the i30N, this is a good DCT. It's clearly gone through a lot of iterations in order to get it right, uh, but it is right. Um, and it's actually tuned better in the i30N and it is in some of the other products that it's also doing service in, like the new Sonata N-Line. Um, the tune here in the i30N is aggressive, but really, really intuitive. You can keep the gearbox in its most relaxed mode, which really suits low speed driving and commuting and you don't actually have to change it. When you get out here onto a back road, the car has such an array of sensors for the gearbox that it knows you're on a great road. It can sense your G inputs, throttle, brake, steering, and the gearbox really selects a sportier profile just like that. Downshifts progressively and intuitively under brakes, and then it holds that profile, that sportier profile, for longer than the GTI does in similar circumstances. So it's almost a case of that Hyundai are almost out DSGing the DSG in that sense. It is a really well sorted auto. You do have paddle shifters here on the wheel, plastic, but nice and big. Uh, and taking over manual control, easy. Nice quick shifts, not quite as quick as the DSG, I don't think, but still very much at your command but leaving it in drive is actually all you have to do the gearbox reads your mind really really well it's it's well done seriously good job on that Hyundai and then the ride and handling that's where there's so many reminders of the things that we love and hate about the i30N this car is it's brawny you know not just in engine performance and sound but also in the way it progresses down 
a road. It feels like you're just grabbing it by the scruff of its neck and just shoving it down a B road. It actually reminds me a lot of an Evo or a full drive rally car from days gone by that you can just get into the throttle early, hard in a corner and it just scoops you out. The diff works so hard in the i30N. It's, it's otherworldly, seriously, it's so much fun. But that is kind of the defining cornering trait of the i30N, diff-based fast corner exit. Plus we're helped by the seriously grippy Pirelli P0HN tyres which really show up the potenzas on the Golf in this test. So you lean on the tyres a lot more in the i30N, also because it sits flatter, it doesn't have that lean that the GTI has and always has had and in some senses makes the GTI more of a layered car to drive. I think that the alterations to the suspension on the i30N have really helped this car over the years. It does lean a little more in the corners now and it's softer at both ends. But particularly the rear is much more keen to come around on the brakes at road speeds than when this car launched. When it launched I complained that you really had to be on a track in order to shift the chassis around. That's no longer the case thanks to a bunch of Australian led changes to the suspension which have worked. So there are layers to the i30N. It's just really built around that hard working diff muscular engine, great noise, where you just plant the boot and it works. And for a lot of drivers, that's what they'll want. But it's noisier in here. The seat isn't as comfortable. It doesn't have the thigh extender anymore, sadly. The speakers aren't as good, noticeably. We don't have adaptive crews, although we do have lane keep assist that works really well now. So it doesn't have the same polish and refinement and luxury as a Golf GTI. It doesn't have as many layers of driver involvement either. Where the GTI, you really do have to work with the car to get it, you know, towards 10 tenths. The i30N gets there easier and stronger, but with less driver input. So it's really a choose your own adventure kind of story here. We've got two great cars. What choice, you know, what absolute choice. That's something that should be celebrated. They're very different, but they achieve highly in their own ways. In a hot hatch, the driving is the critical element, but where you spend all your time is inside the car, and so getting the cabins right on these vehicles is also critical. The Mark 8 Golf is a brand new generation, so its interior feels almost forcefully modern, whereas the 2021 i30N is a facelift. We've seen this cabin for the last three or four years in Hyundai i30s, but we've now got a bit more tech and also a few cool features that they've subbed in for the N at this important midlife update. But prices are also up. They're a little closer to the Golf GTI than they were before. It is still around 10% cheaper to buy the Hyundai i30N, but it's not the absolute bargain it once was. A base manual's now $44,500. The DCT starts at $47,500, and if you want a fully loaded car with sunroof like this one, it's gonna set you back $52,000 before on-road costs but it's a fairly complete car at that money. We have these cool new N sport seats, the light sport seat, fixed headrest, leather and Alcantara. They're comfortable and supportive to a point, though after about two hours in the saddle, I found that I was lacking under thigh support. Interestingly, compared to the old premium, uh, they're actually manually adjustable, but you do sit lower in the car as a result because you don't need that motor for the seats jacking up your driving position, and ultimately, I prefer that change. Steering wheel largely carries over, perforated stitched leather with custom drive modes that you can get to right from the steering wheel, new buttons for end grin shift to bring you that overboost and faster shifts for 20 seconds, and a few more safety features that I spoke about when we drove the car. Now here in the center, we have a 10 and a quarter inch touchscreen, which is new, higher res, not quite as easy to navigate as the old infotainment system here and there used, but still decent. Wired Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, unlike the wireless systems you get in the Golf, and the stereo definitely isn't on the same level as the Harman Kardon that you get in the Volkswagen. But in terms of practicality, it's good. Big cup holders, wireless charging, bottle holders in the doors, and material quality is actually really nice. Lots of soft touch surfaces, lots of soft leather. You can tell Hyundai definitely benchmarked the old Golf GTI when they were developing this cabin for the i30N. But there are, like the Golf, areas of scratchy plastic that you can find too. 
The final note I would say is that if you prefer buttons to touchscreens, the i30N is your car. We've got proper buttons for the control, for the climate control here. We've got buttons for all the seat heating and easy access, quick access shortcuts here on the touchscreen too. Neither of these vehicles is king size in terms of passenger space, but as you can see here in the i30N, it's perfectly fine if you need to transport adults in row two on occasion. For myself, behind these new seats, legroom's fine, tow room is fine as well, and headroom, I've got just enough underneath this panoramic sunroof. Keeping in mind the only way you can get a premium i30N with an auto is with that sunroof so you know if you want the fancy features you're going to be taking up a bit of headspace in the back in terms of amenities we've got a flip down armrest with cup holders and that's about it because there's no air vents in the back of the i30n which is a bit of a disappointment reason being the physical handbrake actually takes up the space of the electrics uh, where those usually sit but in a car like this you kind of want a physical handbrake we do get soft touch materials in the back though, hardly the main point of a hot hatch, but better than you get in a Golf. The interior of the new Golf GTI is probably the part of this car which changed the most compared to the old Mark 7.5, which is actually a very similar car under the skin, but you wouldn't know that sitting here in the driver's seat. The structure of the dashboard, the steering wheel, the seats, everything here is both visually distinct and it works differently as well. Now we've published quite a lot of new golf content on chasing cars recently, and we've had a lot to say about the technology package in this car, which can broadly be broken down to that you get a really cool virtual cockpit, really good digital gauges, particularly in the GTI where they've got their own graphics and it works incredibly well through shortcuts here on the steering wheel. And then there's the central touchscreen which doesn't work as well. It's laggy, the software interface isn't especially well designed because there are small targets you have to hit while you're driving down bumpy roads. But more concerningly is the bugs that seem to arise in some people's Golf GTIs. And you can see a bit about this online uh, in owner forums and stuff, but in this particular car, um, it's developed an issue where it, you start it and you get a sequence of faults and the central touchscreen is inoperative for some time. And that's currently happening in this very shot, uh, which is a little bit unusual. But look, it's kind of a one-off thing in this particular test. It's been working properly up until now. And some of the features are genuinely good, like wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, which means you can just leave your phone in your pocket or if you need to charge it, there's wireless charging here beneath a really handy little shelf. Usually with wireless charging, if anything but a phone goes in there, it doesn't like it. But here you can leave your phone on the wireless charger and use it for other practical purposes. Similarly, we have big cup holders. We've got a key shelf. We've got an adjustable armrest in this car that works really well. We've got big flock line bottle holders. So Volkswagen still nail those practicality points you know, more comprehensively than Hyundai. And then we have the seats, which are more comfortable for long haul driving than the seats in the i30N. They similarly have this fixed headrest here. They're quite similar in shape, but they're more deeply bolstered. They have an electronic lumbar four ways, fully electrically adjustable for the driver, and they're both heated and cooled as well. Plus we have a heated steering wheel. So if you do road trips, if you drive for hours at a time, the Golf GTI soothes you considerably more than the i30N. And I think that's reflected in the way the car drives as well. This vehicle really does let you relax into it. It lets you enjoy, I guess, a slightly more opulent experience while still being able to turn it on when you want. And speaking of that, you get lots of red pops through the interior, including in the ambient lighting that you would expect from a GTI. All right, let's check out the back seats. Here in the back of the Golf GTI, it's a little bit tighter than the i30N with my seat here in my own driving position, but it's a much of a muchness. I'd say that the seat base in the second row of the Golf GTI is a little bit better inclined to support the legs over a long drive, and there's equally more headroom because the sunroof is not as panoramic. Legroom is fine, tow room is pretty good. And as for amenities back here, you do get air vents and a separate temperature zone in the back of the Golf GTI, which if you've got passengers in the back on a hot day here in Australia, they're gonna appreciate the airflow, that's for sure. We also have a flip down armrest with two and a half cup holders. We've got bottle holders in the doors, but 
scratchier plastics here in the back compared to the Hyundai. Around the back of the Golf GTI, there's no missing what car this is, not only because we have this new centered GTI badging, but also because even though this is a new generation, it's classically a Golf. Volkswagen doesn't really mess with the design of their most important hatchback, and I think that's reflected in the fairly elegant lines of the Mark 8, although I know not everybody likes that new front end. Opening the boot is still done via that little badge trick on the Mark 8 Golf, and it opens up to reveal 374 litres of space in updated form. We still have a few tricks. The dual height boot floor gives you a little bit more space, or you can bring the boot floor up to have a fully flat load bay if you need to fold those seats 60-40. We've also got a couple of cubby spaces. We've got hooks. We've got a slightly sturdier cargo cover too. And just like the i30M, there's a space saver spare underneath the boot floor of the Mark 8 GTI, giving you slightly more confidence for country touring. Here around the back of the updated i30N, the facelift is less evident than it is up the front, but that's okay, because I actually think the PD i30N is a pretty good looking car. It still keeps the triangular third brake light, which is an awesome little flourish. Their fastback was sold in Australia alongside the hatchback uh, throughout the earlier iteration of this generation. It's now entering sort of a final edition send off. So the main range will be the hatchback, but also a new sedan. However, this is a nice practical body style, which really does what a hot hatch is all about. Lots of space inside, but also good amounts of boot space. 392 liters. As you can see, there's a bit of a step into the boot there, but there is a net on the floor helping you to secure objects. And there's also the strut brace, which carries over from the pre-facelift version of the car, which does add to the rigidity of the vehicle. So you can remove the strut brace if you need to put something longer and flatter into the boot, but I think most people will just leave it in most of the time. Nice and easy to close. Out of the two here, slightly more boot space in the i30, but it's fairly line ball. So it swings and roundabouts with the running costs of these cars. In some areas, the i30 is cheaper, in others, it's more expensive. Fuel consumption, it definitely uses more premium petrol than the Volkswagen Golf GTI. In our testing, we manage around 11 litres per 100 k's combined in the i30N, so it is going to cost you more to fill this vehicle up because you're going to be doing it more often. Now, servicing on paper is a lot cheaper for the i30N, $1,595 for five years of servicing. But there is a catch because you have to service the i30N every 10,000 k's rather than every 15,000 Ks for the Golf. So if you do the same mileage across both cars, it ends up being relatively similar. The warranty for both, including the Hyundai, is five years with unlimited kilometers. And finally, insurance. In the last 12 months, the median Budget Direct customer spent $876 to comprehensively insure a new Hyundai i30. Keep in mind that data relates to the whole i30 range. Everybody's situation varies though, and your premium will vary based on things insurers take into account, like where you live, who drives the car, how you garage the car, etc. Next up, let's talk about the running costs of the Volkswagen Golf GTI, which are in the main, attractively low. The first place that starts is fuel consumption. Volkswagen have made improvements over the years to the engine that the GTI uses, and in Mark 8 form, it's actually astoundingly frugal. In our testing, it uses about eight liters per 100 Ks combined and significantly less than that on the highway and on country roads where you keep your speed up. Next up is insurance. In the last 12 months, the median Budget Direct customer paid $985 to comprehensively insure a new Volkswagen Golf. Keep in mind that is the whole Golf range that those numbers are taken from. Everybody's situation varies and your premium will vary based on things insurers take into account, like where you live, your driving history, how the car is garaged, etc. The warranty on the Golf GTI, like the i30, is five years unlimited kilometers. And Volkswagen sell upfront servicing packs at a discount. The five year 75,000 kilometer pack costs you $2,450. So while the GTI is a bit more expensive to service than the Hyundai, it's gonna save you almost $700 a year in petrol because the i30N is so much thirstier. So that brings us to the end of this interesting and difficult comparison between two really great small performance cars. I always find these hot hatch tests are difficult to adjudicate, particularly where the Golf GTI is involved because it's so unlike other hot hatches. Not only is it light and agile, 
and fun to drive on different levels, but it can also do the GT luxury car touring thing better than any other hot hatch on the market. So if that's what you're looking for, the ability to mix comfort, grand touring, road tripping ability with pretty terrific B-roll abilities, the Golf GTI is your car. However, the new automatic Hyundai i30N has thrown a massive spanner in the works. There's no avoiding the fact the i30N is never as relaxing to drive as the Golf GTI. It's always on, you know, you always feel like you're driving a sports car in the i30N. Ultimately, it delivers more smiles per mile. It's the hot hatch you buy if you want that kind of maximum brawn in a front wheel drive package at this price level. You want the silly noises. You want that firm and focused suspension all the time because ultimately what you want is a hot hatch. You know, you're not looking for the luxury car experience. So for me, now that you can buy the i30N in DCT that makes it easier to live with every day, I think it's a particularly compelling proposition. But I can see the reasons for purchasing either of these vehicles. And ultimately I'm keen to know your view. Which of these hot hatches takes out the crown in your eyes? Let me know down below in the comments. While you're there, make sure to hit subscribe if you haven't already and the notification bell. And as always, thanks for watching Chasing Cars.